Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Salman Kishavji, and uh, I'm a professor of global health and social medicine in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And I just want to let everyone know uh, before we dive into the, the uh, workshop, the uh, symposium, that uh, it's being recorded. So please be aware that it's being recorded. If you put your, your uh, uh, a camera on, you will be seen and recorded. And when you speak, you will be recorded. And things that you type in the chat eventually will be recorded. Uh, just before we start off on the uh, seminar, let me hand over to Professor Alan Brandt, uh, the chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Alan. Thanks so much, Salman. As I think many of you know, I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the department in the face of Paul Farmer's tragic loss. And I would say in the department, we have obviously been mourning Paul, but at the same time, we're doing what we all think Paul would want us to do is to push forward on our incredibly ambitious intellectual and social and practical agenda. So I just wanted to be here to welcome you all to this session that's in our series of symposia that have celebrated the 150th year of social medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I have to say, as a historian, as a historian of disease and epidemic diseases, I've been particularly looking forward to this session. And for those of us who do social medicine and global health, examining epidemics and pandemics has always been one of our most um, important tools to understand not just the past and social behaviors and relationships and economic and political structures, but to use what we can learn from studying past epidemics and pandemics to understanding the present and to thinking about the future. And of course, this um, session comes at a critical point in the COVID pandemic that we've all been um, living through um, with great duress, often great distress and incredible tragedy. So I think the work that our group has been doing under the notion of pandemics as biosocial is just incredibly important. So let me turn it back to Salman to introduce the topic in somewhat more depth. And um, we're really glad that you're all here today. Thank you so much, Alan. So we're going to run this uh, this symposium slightly differently than other ones. I think what we're, we're we're hoping to do is to have a real conversation because, you know, as Alan says that, that we we've understood epidemics in a certain way for for a long time, and for those of us studying it from the social medicine perspective, it's clear that we have to start to be thinking about ec epidemics a little bit differently. And um, so I've asked. Uh, uh, Marty Zeev, who, who you can see on the screen, and I have, have worked on this and thought about this for the last few months, and we've asked three people to join us uh, who are dealing with epidemics in complex ways. Uh, one is Professor David Jones, and many of you know him, but for those who don't, he's trained in psychiatry and the history of science. He's the Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine at Harvard University. And his research over the last number of years has explored the causes and meanings of health inequities. He wrote a book called Rationalizing Epidemics, Meanings and Uses of American Indian Mortality Since 1600. So that's a pretty deep dive. <laughs> and Decision Making and Cardiac Therapeutics. He wrote a book called Broken Hearts, The Tangled History of Cardiac Care. And he's now involved in three new products, uh, projects. He's looking at the evolution of, of coronary artery surgery. He's looking at heart disease and cardiac therapeutics in India. He's looking at the threat of air pollution on health. Uh, so really interesting uh, uh, ways of looking at what's happening in the world. And as we know, we're having these epidemics of, uh, of, of heart disease, diabetes, and a number of other things. So David teaches the history of medicine, medical, medical ethics, and social medicine at Harvard College and at Harvard Medical School. So we're going to call on him to bring his knowledge about those areas for this conversation. We also have with us uh, Dr. Reagan Marsh, who's an emergency physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. And she's worked for partners in health in Haiti and Malawi and Sierra Leone and Liberia and the US leading emergency care and health systems strengthening after emergencies. And she's currently the senior strategic advisor 
for the PIH US team and the medical director of health equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She, she really was deeply, deeply involved in the epidemic, uh, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. And as we know, uh, you know, we've, we've heard from Paul over, over the years how uh, there was so much that could have been done that didn't happen and, and PIH tried to do a lot. And so, you know, with Reagan, we're really gonna examine uh, the social aspects of, of this epidemic along with the biology. And then lastly, we're really grateful to have Dr. Eric Krakauer, who is an associate professor of medicine and global health at Harvard Medical School. He's an attending physician in the Division of Palliative Care in Geriatric Medicine at MGH. He's the honorary chair of the Department of Palliative Care at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. He previously served as the medical officer for palliative care at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. He was a member of the Lancet Commission on Palliative Care, and he's on the board of directors of the International Association for Hospice uh, and, and, and Palliative Care. He's worked in a number of middle-income countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and the Americas to help integrate palliative care into healthcare services and education. And uh, most recently, he's assisted Vietnam, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Rwanda to make opiates safely accessible for pain relief. Now, when we think of opiates, we, we often uh, uh, think of, of over-prescription in the United States uh, and, and you know, the pharma industries and things associated with that. And Eric is working on a completely different axis. He's working on the epidemic of, of, of pain that is faced by so many people around the world who have a number of diseases that require palliation, either at the point of death or, or, or hopefully well before. And so you know, he's going to be talking to us uh, about that epidemic. And I, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I've worked on tuberculosis for the last uh, 25 plus years. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully I'll bring to bear some of my thoughts as we have this uh, conversation. So let, let's begin by just thinking a little bit about why we're having this conversation. We've just come, we're, we're, we're coming out of, or we're in the latter part of uh, a pandemic of, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, I think many of us have seen that uh, as the pandemic uh, proceeded, um, you know, some of the tools that we had available were not, um, you know, were, were, were not, uh, uh, they, they weren't used and they weren't deployed. And many of the social things that were deployed alienated people. When vaccines were created, they weren't, they weren't distributed uh, equally globally. And so, you know, just without even having a deep understanding of social medicine, you, you know, you can understand that there's something uh, going on here that's more than just the pathogen more than just the COVID-19 bug and its variants. Um, you know, in the area of tuberculosis, those of us that have been working on it, many of us in our department uh, have been working on it for, you know, a quarter century or some, some people more, some people a little bit less. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got this disease that's been treatable since 1948. There's medicines that are available. They're off patent. Uh, you know, we know we, we've had x-rays to screen people, you know, available since, you know, Roentgen, I believe, won the won the Nobel Prize for that. I think it was in 1905 or something or 1895, like some, you know, like a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago. So a long, long time back. And, and you, you, know, you, you start to look at it and say, well, um, you know, and it was, it was deployed first and, you know, x-rays were deployed as a screening method in Edinburgh in the early 20th century. They were found to be effective and they were rolled out all over, you know, much of the world. And then you find that uh, when it came to dealing with this in poorer places, poor communities, poor countries, it just, you know, it just disappeared. And so, you know, you start to say, um, when we start to look at disease, there tends to be a focus on the molecular mechanisms of microbial pathogenesis. And I think as a social medicine department, it behooves us to start to look at the social mechanisms of microbial pathogenesis and other pathogenesis that is non-microbial. So, you know, in, in the case of my work and and Reagan's work, you know, it may be microbial, but certainly in, the, in what we're going to hear from Eric and what we're going to hear from, from David, it, it's not microbial, it's other things. And I think, you know, just, just to, 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 to reflect Paul, I wish he was here because when we were planning this, he, uh, you know, it was something he's very interested in. But, you know, for those of you that read uh, uh, Fevers, Fuse and Diamonds, you'll, you'll recognize that, that Paul, uh, you know, uh, in there, he, he actually quotes Louis Pasteur, right? He, he quotes Louis Pasteur talking about the idea of terrain. He says that terrain is everything. Host factors are everything. And of course, you know, you can view this purely biologically, but Paul, of course, 
uh, pulls that out and says, you know, when you start to look at pathogenic forces, how they get into the body, how they take their toll, uh, how they vary from person to person, you realize that a lot of these things are not purely molecular events. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, man-made uh, events. And I think as you, um, as you saw with Ebola, as we saw with Ebola globally, certainly with vaccine distribution, we're also plagued by this control over care uh, a paradigm that that is you know that reigns seems to reign around the world, and that is that that you know the the idea is to limit the spread of things rather than provide care or make substantive changes. So you know this whole idea of containment with epidemics, and of course that requires a rethinking, right? Because you can't contain diabetes in 750 million people, and you can't contain air pollution that is all over the world. You have to stop it. You have to change it. So really, really trying to think about these. Uh, in different ways. So I've, I've, I've said enough, I think, by way of introduction, and I, I want to just start the discussion and maybe start with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, David. And, you know, David, you, you as a historian have been looking at this for a long time. And, you know, there's, the, the, there's two questions I have for you. So how, how does the social medicine perspective, uh, how does that transform the way we should be dealing or have been dealing with classic pandemics like TB and HIV. And, you know, as you're looking at the work you're doing, looking at air pollution and disease, how, what do we need to change to, you know, as we're, as we're, we're classifying and thinking about pandemics? I mean, that's a very hard question, but just to, to get the conversation off the ground. Yeah. So, uh, Salman, thanks for this invitation to take part uh, and address these, these questions of these modern pandemics, heart disease and air pollution. Uh, like many of the people in this department, I started off my life interested in traditional epidemics. And my initial work was on smallpox and tuberculosis. For a variety of reasons, I moved to work on heart disease, first in the US, then in India. Uh, that led to my interest in air pollution, first in India, now back in the US. Uh, and that has led to a more general concern about the health consequences of the climate crisis. So a skeptic could say, why does it make sense to think about any of these, heart disease or air pollution? as epidemics or pandemics or even as problems for social medicine? Uh, well, the short answer is that they're clearly problems for social medicine well, and fair, I think fairly thought of as epidemics. Let me explain why in a few ways. When the Hippocratic writers started writing about epidemics, uh, they had no notion of contagion. They wrote about conditions that were prevalent in a population. Uh, it was only much later, really, in the 19th century that the notion of the intuitive notion of epidemics narrowed to outbreaks of infectious disease, but that narrowing never really stuck. Uh, in popular usage, you can find discussions of all sorts of epidemics, opioid epidemic, epidemics of obesity, gun violence, just about anything is now described in the language of an epidemic. And so you can make a strong case that heart disease is an epidemic by either dev definition. Uh, it's certainly prevalent in the old Hippocratic meaning of the word. It's the leading cause of death in most countries in the world and has been for the better part of a century, depending on where you are. Uh, and you could make a case uh, that it's contagious. Uh, Nicholas Christakis famously showed uh, that both tobacco and obesity uh, were contagious in a population. And those two so-called behavioral risk factors are just two of many other ways in which the social determinants of health shape epidemics of heart disease and everything else. And if you look at the course of heart disease, at least in the United States over the 20th century, uh, the pattern of the epidemic exhibits the classic rise and fall of an epidemic wave from low in the early 20th century, peaking in the mid 20th century, declining since that time. Uh, the shape of the curve uh, bears an uncanny resemblance to that of tuberculosis, shifted 50 years more presently uh, towards the present. And also like with tuberculosis, there's been a battle royale amongst epidemiologists, historians, and cardiologists uh, to debate what has caused the rise and fall of these pandemics. Uh, and it's really a social analysis that is the key to understanding both of these things, whether it's heart disease uh, or tuberculosis. Well, what about air pollution? Uh, again, there's no doubt anymore about prevalence. Some of you may have seen the big report yesterday uh, published in Lan Lancet Planetary Health coming out from IHME and the Global Burden of Disease Project. Uh, pollution killed 9 million people in 2019. That's one in six of all deaths um, amongst humans on this planet. Um, that one in six death toll is similar to tuberculosis in the 19th century, uh, which also was likely 
exacerbated by air pollution. Uh, the, while deaths from indoor air pollution related to cooking and from water pollution have been decreasing since 2015, which is progress, the mortality from ambient air pollution, like the air pollution out in the atmosphere, has increased 60%, 60%. Uh, since 2000, causing 6.5 million deaths in 2019. Uh, and deaths from lead exposure have also increased uh, over the recent decades. Now, the article that has this data in Lancet Planetary Health makes a very immodest claim of causality that would really get under Paul's skin. Uh, they describe this mortality as the unintended consequence of industrialization and urbanization. Uh, and how can you possibly claim that an outcome is unintended when actions were taken deliberately despite certain knowledge what the consequences of those actions would be? And also with air pollution, I, you could make a case, this is more of a stretch, but you could make a case that air pollution is contagious. Uh, as a first pass analysis, air pollution is a disease of British imperialism. Uh, the British infected both India and China with coal-fired industrialization in the 19th century. As a second pass analysis, it's a disease of economic rivalry between the great powers. Uh, US and Germany and others invested heavily in industrialization to keep up with England in the 19th century. And China and India both invested heavily in coal powered industrialization in the 1950s and 1960s as part of their effort to catch up with the West. And then like with traditional epidemics, air pollution is certainly a problem for environmental and social justice. Uh, Pollution, air pollution has made a preferential option for the poor who have always and continue to bear the brunt of the mortality. Uh, in the United States, and I suspect elsewhere, uh, the death toll of air pollution is highly racialized. Black and brown communities are most heavily exposed. Uh, Paul and Jean, as many of you know, have been strategizing to bring Maxine Burkett into our department. Uh, she's an expert on race and social justice, and she would bring much needed expertise on these issues. And in the last way, I think it's useful to think about these epidemics or pandemics uh, is that we all have a good sense that traditional epidemics, infectious diseases, are susceptible to purposeful social action. And whether it's you know, the famous case of the Broad Street Pump or the kinds of work that Paul had mobilized against tuberculosis and HIV in many different countries, uh, there is po po potential here for purposeful social action against heart disease and air pollution. Uh, just as wealthy countries mobilized the resources needed to control TB in the 20th century, similar progress was made against heart disease in the late 20th century. Uh, the United States has made substantial progress against air pollution. Our air is much cleaner than it was in 1970, but obviously much more could be done. Uh, remains to be seen what will happen in China, India, or other developing countries on this front. And, and the last thing I'll say is that air pollution should probably be seen as the first major epidemic of the broader and burgeoning climate crisis. Uh, air pollution is a direct effect of the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, combustion of fossil fuels has another effect, uh, the increasing carbon dioxide levels we've seen in the atmosphere. And we're already seeing the results of that, whether it's warming uh, with the current heat wave in South Asia or the increasing atmospheric energy that causes worsening uh, storms and natural disasters. There are cities in India and Pakistan, the Punjab, that are now pushing the limits on human, human survivability uh, during the current heat wave. The US is now at the start of its annual natural disaster season uh, with tornadoes, hurricanes, and forest fires. <clears throat> Even if purposeful social action has helped to mitigate air pollution in many countries, it's really hard to be optimistic right now uh, that action will be taken that is needed, the, the action needed to avert the climate crisis will be taken. Uh, it's incredibly depressing to see the current gridlock, uh, especially in the Senate. Uh, and you know, if the US doesn't take substantial action, it's hard to imagine that China or India will as well. There's, there's been a conference this past week at the South Asia Institute celebrating some anniversary of the SAI. And, you know, and one of these issues came up. Uh, over you know, who's producing the most air pollution now versus who, who produced the most air pollution historically. Uh, and the answers to those questions are different. Uh, but the, the point that the South Asian scholars made quite vociferously that if you look at the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere 
there is no doubt that the entities primarily responsible uh, are US and Western Europe. And that's really where the burden is going to have to fall to figure out some solution to this problem. Uh, and it's tragic that our government seems completely unwilling uh, to own up to that responsibility. David, can I ask you just uh, before we jump from you to, to the next uh, uh, speaker, like, is there, um, like, def definitionally, you've, you've referred a couple of times, you know, to like about transmissibility, and you refer to Nicholas Christakis' work, which I think is great, right, because it, it shows that things are happening in clusters and stuff. And from the social medicine perspective, do we have to uh, you know, just to borrow Paul's words, do we need to re-socialize the definition? Because I'm just thinking back to the course that we were teaching together when we read uh, Frederick Engels in 1945. I mean, sorry, 1845, he pointed out, you know, that, that disease was being transmitted in these communities, you know, by rats, by poor housing. He actually, as you as you well know, referred to, to air, right, before we were even measuring 2.5 micron air particles and stuff. And I just wonder, you know, is it a very... Uh, 19th century definition to say that it has to be transmissible from person to person by touch or cough or something. Because, you know, when we're looking at diabetes and we link it to, say, food policies and we link it to uh, the processing of foods and the use of high fructose corn syrup or whatever it may be, you know, uh, or if we're looking at inflammation caused by 2.5 micron air particles and how it may lead to early heart disease or asthma or, 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 or uh, diabetes, in fact. Like, you know, is the transmissibility necessarily person to person or is it so social that it's happening through these social mechanisms of policies? I, it depends on what, you, what you're looking at. The answer would probably be different for heart disease and for air pollution, but certainly for air pollution, uh, I mean, I, 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 you could probably make a case that air, indoor air pollution is somehow direct individual contagion because you no, know, it's an individual behavior that then you know, what kind of cooking fuel are you using in your stove and people who come into your kitchen are then exposed to that. But in terms of ambient air pollution, uh, that's entirely, or not entirely, largely a societal level problem. Now you could say it's the fault of individual industrialists uh, who are failing to install emission controls in their factories and, and they are the ones who are infecting everyone downwind of them uh, with this toxin. But in some ways that, it, I think it's useful to think of it in that way. Uh, because to the extent that international action is ever going to happen against either air pollution or uh, the climate crisis, it's because of this fear of transboundary spread. Uh, well, well that's gives... the thing. That, that that's the thing I want to push you on because I'm seeing Warwick Anderson is on is on is on right now, and in his book, you know, the the driver really was fear of contagion. What do we do for diseases that aren't the classic contagion, right? Like if you can get heart disease from pollution, it's still quote unquote contagious, but not in the classic sense that we view it, right? Yeah, but it, it raises an, a problem for international governance, uh, which is do we have international treaties that will have teeth that will allow some of these things to be changed? There, there, there is one precedent for successful action, which was the ozone hole. Uh, so the ozone hole uh, was recognized as a problem in the 1980s and has largely been fixed. And in that case, that was an issue of Canada uh, rightfully protesting against the United States and Scandinavia rightfully protesting against England and Germany, saying, look, what you are doing in your countries is destroying our countries. You have to do something. Uh, and in that case, US, England, and uh, Germany owned up to it. Uh, and the core fluorocarbon core four carbon, uh, controls were implemented. And the ozone is in much better shape. Uh, I taught a graduate seminar a couple of years ago uh, on air pollution, and two of the students in the class were people at the Kennedy School, uh, one from China, one from South Korea, both of whom were involved in their government ministries dealing with air pollution. Uh, and it got tense at times uh, between the two of them, because if you're in South Korea, basically, I forget what percentage was, a very high percent of the ambient air pollution in South Korea is coming from China. Uh, and like, there's nothing they can do about it other than persuasion. Uh, and so they feel very much uh, at the mercy of the Chinese government in this respect. And they don't like feeling at the mercy of the Chinese government for a variety of understandable reasons. Uh, and it's gonna take some hard uh, diplomacy uh, to, to solve some of these problems. Thanks, David. So 
Eric, let, let, let me jump to you. You know, I, you and I have been talking about this for a, a number of years, and I know that you uh, organized a conference that I, I came to in Austria some years ago, and I remember really thinking, being shocked at the data that were presented on this, this kind of uh, epidemic of pain, if we can call it that. And it's, you know, uh, you know, those of us that are students of history, we, we obviously know that, that, that opiates have been available for a long time. There, the opiate wars, Britain was encouraging uh, people to use it. It was produced en masse in India. Uh, you know, it's played a huge role in, in, the, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And then suddenly you hear that, well, it's not available in some places and people are dying, screaming and suffering and in pain. And I know when we were setting up our HIV TB program in Lesotho, we had a crazy amount of trouble getting dilated for people with Kaposi sarcoma, people who hadn't received treatment for their HIV and we eventually did, but it was very complicated. So I just, if you could just introduce us just as a start, you know, um, you, you know, we, we think of morphine as this thing that costs like one cent or two cents and widely available. And yet, uh, you know, where where is it available? Where is it not available? And I guess the real question is, why is it not available? You're, you're on mute, by the way. Thanks, Alman. Um... You know, listening to well, thanks for inviting me, and this is this is a, a, a fabulous the rethinking of of an epidemics and pandemics. Um, uh, listening to David, I kept thinking that the real vector is greed and arrogance. Uh, European uh, insistence on um, uh, amassing wealth and um, uh, and sucking it out of the rest of the world uh, for for personal benefit. Um, uh, I, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a I'm a palliative care uh, physician, and I, uh, you know, working all over the world in low and middle income countries, it's well, it's no longer shocking for me because I guess I am so familiar with it. But it's it's still astonishing, and I see it in my colleagues I bring with me. Why people with severe pain have no access to pain relief all over the world, especially the poorer uh, in the poorer countries. So um, opioid analgesics are rarely accessible in low and middle income countries to answer your question. 90% approximately, 90% uh, of the world's medicinal opioids, which is mainly morphine, but also you mentioned hydromorphone, oxycodone, fentanyl, there are various ones. 90% are consumed in high income countries where there's 17% of the world's population. 83%, okay. approximately 90% of the world's medicinal opioids are consumed in high income countries which has around 17% of the world's population. I might be off a little bit. And by the way, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about history here to historians. So I'm gonna just uh, plead ignorance in advance. And if I say I'm a, I'm a complete amateur historian. Uh, so uh, if I say something wrong, I won't take offense. Just let me know I get it wrong. But, um, but think about that. So 83% of the world's population consumes only around 10, actually it's more like 9% of the world's medicinal opioids, which essentially means that most people in low and middle income countries have no access. They just simply bear the pain or don't bear it. Now, why is that a problem? Well, you know, people can make meaning of pain um, and have over millennia to, uh, to make it somehow comprehensible uh, in, within a, 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 a culture or a, a religion or a way of understanding the world. But we know that people with severe pain can't function, uh, don't eat, uh, don't move around, therefore uh, get weaker, get uh, pressure ulcers, don't take deep breaths and get pneumonia and die. Uh, from various things, from pneumonia, from deep vein thrombosis, from malnutrition. So pain is life-threatening. Um, and 
on top of that, most pain is not that hard to relieve. It's actually easy to relieve. And I see this all the time when I go to a hospital in wherever and someone who's been in bed for weeks um, because of pain and the pain of getting out of bed and with a little bit of morphine, um, they're out of bed, moving around, eating, taking care of the kids, maybe even getting back to work and they think I'm a genius. Um, it's just because the opioids aren't available. So why aren't they available, you ask? Well, surprised, there's some social roots of the uh, pandemic of untreated pain. Um, and uh, for those of you actually who, 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 who want to explore this more, I can cite the historians who work on this, including Keith Wei Lu, whose book, uh, who's I think spoken in this series and who's got an important book on pain. Um, I think you know him. Uh, Alfred McCoy at the University of Wisconsin is one of the more important uh, historians of, of opioids. So, um, Opium, you mentioned the British East, East India Company uh, and the British in India. Opium and opioids have been used and continue to be used as means to achieve political and economic power and goals. And that's been going on for a long time and it continues. So uh, the British East India Company, and it wasn't just the British, it was the Dutch, it was the French, it's been the US, have used opioids, uh, for example, the British to reverse the trade deficit with China in the 18th century, to generate revenue for colonial regimes, um, the British in India, the French in Indochina, uh, the Dutch um, in Indonesia, and then uh, when the, the properties of opioids were better understood to control populations and help stave off rebellion. Uh, the yeah. British East India Company, which existed from around 1600 till officially till 1874, but actually was not really functional uh, uh, decades before that. This was the biggest drug cartel in history. It was the Brits. Um, they had more soldiers than the British army. Uh, they were incredibly powerful. The, 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 the company was incredibly powerful. And as you know well, and I, I, how much time are we supposed to, am I supposed to have? Well, you know, I, I was just going to say, it's such a deep history. I wonder if you, if, if you can jump from that to why we don't have it today. Cause... Oh, I will. I will. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be, so I take it that means like five minutes. Yes. Um, okay. So. Essentially, you know, the Brits wanted the tea in India, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the tea in China. The emperor said, uh, well, okay, pay us. And the British said, no, we don't want to pay you, but we'll give you opium. Um, so they grew the opium in India where it was proscribed uh, and collaborated with private traders and organized crime to deliver it to China and distribute it. <clears throat> and this led to the opium wars in the early and mid 19th century, which humiliated and devastated China um, and uh, uh, the effects of which are still being felt. Um, and by the way, I think uh, in China, this is also a reason why uh, uh, insistence on human rights and on um, uh, uh, moral positions is, uh, is not, uh, taken as seriously because how can uh, Western uh, powers that perpetrated such horror and violence have the moral credibility to now uh, uh, force anybody to do anything else? Um, so anyway, this, this, uh, this use of opioids to, for, for political and economic uh, gain and to achieve economic goals has generated a fear and antipathy to opioids, which we call opiophobia. And just as an example, a concrete example of this, the Drug Control Agency in India is still located in the Ministry of Finance because that's how opioids were conceived as a means of generating revenue for the British government. 
So the opioid, uh, the agency in charge of opioids was placed in the Ministry of Finance. And as, as I'll mention, a lot of the colonial laws and regulations about opioids then persisted in uh, the former colonies as they became independent. As the Europeans and the Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century became more aware of the addictive properties of opioids, there began to be prohibitions in the uh, European uh, and uh, in Europe and the United States. And this is part of the temperance movements of that period. Um, there were laws prohibiting, pre previously opium had been available over the counter, then there developed, uh, there were laws created uh, to prescribe opioids, to make them illegal. And those laws were also included in the laws of European colonies. Um, a, a, an example of this in Russia, where I know you've worked a lot, Salman, is the medical field of narcology, which basically right. developed as a, a uh, incorporation, uh, a, a institutionalization of opiophobia, of, of uh, uh, antipathy toward opioids. This continued use of uh, opioids and cocaine uh, later on um, by France and the United States to achieve political ends has just continued to fuel opiophobia. So for Alfred McCoy has written extensively about the, the CIA's use of opioids, uh, which are grown, for example, in the Golden Triangle. The French grew the, the opioid in the Golden Triangle, smuggled it in, in the 50s into uh, Southern Vietnam, it was given to criminal gangs to distribute, and the funds were used to fight the communists in um, uh, in. So, so Eric, let me let me push you on this a little bit because you're telling this sordid history, and I think it's it's a useful history. Like it's a it's a horrible story of how we're getting to where we are, and I just wonder this question: if I didn't know you. I, and if I hadn't worked in other countries, I wouldn't know that there is this epidemic. And is it an epidemic? Like what, you know, like why, you know, you're saying that there, these things are in the ministries in certain ways, but surely doctors and nurses and caregivers around the world are seeing people suffer from you know, when they die from cancer or, or a number of other conditions. Why isn't there an outcry? Like why, how has this happened? And, and, and why would we consider it an epidemic? Well, uh, but should we be rethinking the definition of epidemic to include something like this, or is this just some policy failure or market failure or something else? Well, I think epidemics are often a, a policy failure uh, and uh, market failure. Um, the policy failure is that clinicians, especially doctors, also nurses, don't have the right to prescribe opioids uh, in much of the developing world, and the opioids aren't there. Now, you mentioned earlier on that morphine is really cheap. Well, actually, it's not in a lot of countries. The drug companies, and I haven't gotten to the drug companies yet, but that's a, a, a big issue, which has also driven opiophobia, the epidemic of opioid use disorder and opioid overdoses. And by the way, I've given up complaining about use of the term opioid epidemic. There's no epidemic of opioids. That's like saying there's an uh, epidemic of, of Coca-Cola or, or, or hamburgers. There's an epidemic of opioid use disorder. There's an epidemic of opioid overdoses, um, but it's not the opioid's fault. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, in a lot of countries, Let's take the example of some of the countries where I've worked most closely, uh, with which I've worked most closely. So for Rwanda, for example, a relatively small country, they wanted to make, with its uh, remarkable leadership in the Ministry of Health, they wanted to, to do something about this epidemic of untreated pain, the, uh, of unnecessary pain, of pain that would be very easy to relieve. Um, but when you're a small country, and, and I think Salman, with your work with the Greenlight Commission, you'll be very attuned to this, there's not much 
uh, leverage to negotiate prices. So yeah. if the purchase is going to be small, um, then uh, whether they're going to import, import finished pills from, from India or, opi or morphine powder from somewhere else, they, the, the, it's a small amount and the price will be high if there's a, if there's a, a, a um, pooled purchasing as you did with second line TB drugs, then the price can be driven down by negotiating for a large supply. So the, the, the quick answer to the question is, there aren't opioids available in those countries and physicians don't have the right to prescribe it. And if they do, they can only prescribe very small amounts for very short period. The empty vials have to be returned. The uh, prescriptions have to be in triplicate or have to be signed by uh, not only the doctor prescribing, but by the hospital director and by an anesthesiologist. So in my busy clinic, seeing 50 patients a day, am I gonna be able to go and track down an anesthesiologist and the hospital director to get my prescription for, for a week's worth of morphine? It doesn't happen. Uh, so the result is people suffer unnecessarily. So Eric, let's let's pause there. I mean, you I think you put at the very beginning of your comments, you, you said a really interesting statement. You said the vector is greed and, and arrogance. Uh, I think that's something for us to really ponder. And and Reagan, you know, you you of course have been uh, like you know, like like our other colleagues, you've been in various countries uh, observing uh, and participating in, in caregiving, uh, observing what's going on and participating in caregiving. And I'm struck by, by um, you know, Eric is describing a situation uh, that's driven, it sounds like by bureaucracies, by uh, issues of money making, by greed. But what strikes me as just the most, like, what's very different from what David talked about, although, you know, he did mention race and he mentioned the poor communities are most affected. I feel like, you know, the fact that we can prescribe those medicines here, you know, it's, it, it's clear that like it's it's no big deal. In fact, the argument is that we may be over prescribing them, right? But some people may say, and 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 here you, he's presenting a case where some even in India where it's made, people don't have access to it. So you know, I'm and I'm looking at that and thinking, wow, this is crazy. But you've been involved in a crazy situation too, right? With a disease like Ebola, and I just put like what your reflections are as you hear this. Like, what is the what, what are we facing an epidemic uh, of? Like, I, I'm sorry, that's like, I've, I've got a dangling thing there. Uh, <laughs> what is the epidemic that's taking place uh, with, with Ebola? Like, what, what, is it the disease or, because, you know, Paul always used to say, if you looked at Marburg virus, you, you had the 70% survival, you know, which obviously is, is, is nothing to write home about in general, but it's amazing compared to what was happening in West Africa. And so I just wonder, you know, what are you, what's your take about this epidemic? What, what's the epidemic? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Aman, and I'll echo my my gratitude to be here with everyone. I feel like I'm learning so much. Um, when Eric said uh, an epidemic of greed, I was thinking, I wonder if it's an epidemic of selfishness, right? Which is like very white supremacist in its origins. Um, uh, and I'm reminded of something Joya said once, um, I think probably around 2014 or 2015 when PIH was just initially getting involved in the work in West Africa, she said something to the effect of, and I don't want to misquote here, or misquote her, but we as a globe have sort of globalized access to resources, but we have not globalized responsibility for care. Um, and so sort of implying that in West Africa, Sierra Leone, where I lived and work, that it's it's very reasonable for the diamond mine in Kono, that's the town where PIH works, Koidu Town, Kono District, that that diamond mine is owned by a South African company that's owned by a Chinese parent company, and none of the profits from this extremely prolific diamond mine go into the local community or even into the national economy. Um, and so all of that wealth is exported from Sierra Leone and there is no responsibility for investment in health or education, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So, but Salman, to your question, I think with Ebola, you know, the rhetoric often was one of a terrible virus, right? Like hemorrhagic fever, blood coming out of your eyes, like, you know, Hollywood movies from the 90s. Um, and, and it's certainly true that Ebola is a bad virus, right? Like if you got to pick your viruses, like it would not be one to pick. 
Um, but what we really saw was that it was a, you know, an epidemic of really terrible investment in health systems, particularly in, in West Africa. Um, the Sierra Leone and Liberian health systems at the beginning of the Ebola epidemic were amongst, if not the worst in the world. Um, they had been devastated by, and, and Paul writes about this in his book, um, centuries of extraction, right, in the form of, of people during the slave trade and the, in the form of diamonds and, and other mineral wealth. Um, that had not been met with, a, a, you know, an investment in, in the economy, in the health system, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that worsened during colonialism and then post-colonial period and then into um, the civil wars in both Sierra Leone and, and Liberia, which were distinct civil wars, but certainly intertwined. Um, and when those civil wars ended in the early 2000s, um, the health infrastructure in all, you know, all of PIH's five S's was devastated, right? There was very few um, uh, staff, right? There was not much stuff. There was uh, really poor systems, whether we're talking about ambulances or certainly no 911. Um, and that sort of let it, you know, created this essentially tinderbox that when you put in the Ebola virus, right, exploded um, in a way that we didn't see, right? There was Ebola that went to Nigeria that was promptly and quickly quelled, right? There was a little bit in Europe, right? We saw some in Dallas. And, and so I think really what led to the epidemic of Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia was one of a health system and a public health system that had been so underinvested in that the disease became extremely prolific before we were even able to recognize it. And then and then certainly able to treat it. And I think there was, and you said that's in your opening remarks, Salman, this sort of like tension between containment and treatment, right? And this, this sense that the only thing that could be done for Ebola was to attempt to contain it and to the selfishness, prevent those of us who are elsewhere in Europe and US from getting it. Um, and this was built on the original Ebola models that were largely from Central Africa, DRC and, and Central African Republic where and this was the words of a, of a CDC advisor. The, the strategy was to cut off the road in, cut off the road out and let it burn out, meaning the village of 300 or 500 or 1,000 people would be left to survive and no one would be allowed in and no one would be allowed out. And the CDC was like quite honestly, openly perplexed about what to do with an epidemic that had gotten into capital cities um, wow. in Freetown, in Monrovia, where you couldn't cut off the road in and cut off the road out. And you had to actually think about care. And what we said at the beginning of the, oh yeah. Can I interrupt you for a second? I just want to ask you, you know, this cut the road uh, going in and out. I'm just perplexed because, you know, as we heard it from Paul often and, you know, read subsequently, you know, one, I remember once he was so exhausted and he, so he said, I shouldn't be showing you this, but he showed me an email from really amongst probably the highest global health people in the world that talked, said it was almost impossible to give people, said it was impossible to give people IV fluid. And so what I don't understand is like, you know, you, you, we, we often say, well, you know, you, you, you tell a story of greed. David told a story of greed and pollution and, you know, it's, it's a story linked to extraction. Eric tells a story of greed linked to extraction. You're telling a story of greed linked to extraction. But we're talking about a $2 bag of IV fluids and, and you know, and a needle. And so I'm just wondering, and, and then there's all these volunteers there and the U.S. has sent soldiers and British logisticians and all this stuff. So they're there. Why would you not take the $2 IV bag and put it into somebody's arm like what's what was stopping that I think there's and I, I will also be humble here right as a non-historian right I my 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 uh my skill is as an emergency doc um I think there were probably a handful of things happening one was uh you know the public health experts are not necessarily healthcare experts right um and so Paul and I talked about this a lot right I'm sorry my lights are going out um uh the um, the care of a viral infectious disease, right, I think honestly got a little muddled in the hands of CDC public health experts who don't understand the basics, to your point, Salman, of a $2, probably not even $2 bag of IV fluids. I think there was also, in terms of selfishness, this incredible fear of giving a bullet to healthcare workers, right? And, and we talked about this previously, Salman, is there was an established policy to do quote, no touch nursing, right? Which meant we don't wanna put any healthcare workers, Sierra Leonean, Liberian or external at risk. And so the only thing you literally could do was hand someone a water bottle um, and hope that they could hydrate themselves enough with a little oral rehydration therapy that they could survive Ebola. 
all of this to my first point is deeply antithetical to what we actually know works well in sepsis, which is early resuscitation, throw in an IV, give them a couple liters of fluids, give some antibiotics in case there's concomitant viral or concomitant bacterial infection, um, and then provide early aggressive care, which has been shown to reduce mortality in every disease we look at, whether it's the epidemic of trauma, right, whether it's infectious diseases or cardiovascular disease. Um, and so I think it was a combination of fear. I think it was a combination of selfishness. I think it was a lack of understanding of the disease. Um, and really like the overarching goals were around containment, right? The vast majority of money that was spent on the Ebola response was spent in the US, in Europe, in other places preparing should Ebola come, right? Focus on quarantine or containment um, to West Africa and then um, prepare here. When I returned, I tell the story, when I returned from West Africa, when I returned from Liberia of working in an Ebola treatment unit, the Brigham made me take a six hour course on how to put on PPE right, and paid me for it. And they paid all of the staff. And I thought, oh my God, we just paid probably hundreds of thousands of dollars of salary time to teach people how to put on PPE. Like we could have put that money into paying nurses and providers where the patients are. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, so we face this all the time in, 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 in our, you know, as we're talking about global health, this is, you know, I, I it's, it, it, I, I'm struck by COVID-19 and the fact that you know, even though we knew we had to vaccinate other people in the world, we, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen with strains, but I think at some point we kind of knew that if we vaccinate people, there'll be less variants and, and, you know, it, it'll probably be net better. And even, even, you know, the, you would imagine that if greed were the, the epidemic that we're facing, um, you know, the IMF and the World Bank put out a thing saying that if the U.S. and Europe spent $50 billion intervening on COVID-19, it would lead to nine trillion dollars in global economic growth of which the us is roughly 23 to 25 percent of that so you know two trillion plus dollars of growth in the us economy presumably if it was evenly you know spread and that didn't drive people yeah. that did not drive people to to do to push vaccine equity which was really not going to cost 50 billion it was going to cost about 12 to 20 billion so i guess you know i i'm really moved by eric's statement the vector is greed and arrogance but I, I, I you know but i'm wondering you know in each of these in these scenarios there's a there's kind of like an us and a them right there's some people getting opiates and some people aren't your story some people are getting IV fluids some people aren't david's story some people are getting clean air some people aren't right and i guess what what is the epidemic then because i mean engels kind of said it was about extraction and and greed and the fact that people didn't invest in the health system, the same stuff you're saying. And when Gorgas went to South Africa to look at the mines and why people were dying of TB in 1914, he said, yeah, it's because they're not eating, they have bad housing and they need better health care. So all the stuff that you guys are saying in 2022, Gorgas wrote in 1914 and Engels wrote in 1845. So I'm wondering, what is the epidemic? Is it an epidemic of ignorance? Is it an epidemic of willful ignorance? Is it an epidemic of them and us? Like, what are we facing? In, in some ways, at least for the air pollution, you could say it's, it's a epidemic of nimbyism, of not in my backyard. You know, one, one of the ironies is if, you know, places like Boston historically have had relatively good air pollution because the air blow, most of the smoke that Boston produced just simply blew, blew out to sea. Uh, <laughs> and so the city was able to say, not, not a problem for us. And, and there was no immediate downwind person who was complaining about our emissions. The situation was very different in New Jersey and New York. New York City had a crisis in the 60s and 70s when they realized that air quality was terrible and most of it was because of New Jersey. Uh, and they initially had no power to do anything about this. And that this led to a whole series of interstate compacts that the EPA orchestrated to try to have New Jersey try to do something on behalf of New York City. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the language that surrounds a lot of the air pollution crises that used to hit London and periodically hit places like Delhi, it happens when the air stops moving. And so when, when, when the pollution that you produce is no longer falling on someone else, but is falling on you instead, that then creates the crisis, uh, both medically and, and politically. Uh, and so as long as there's this notion that someone else is suffering, it has been very easy for the producers of air pollution to disregard the problem. Uh, Interesting, I hate to intellectualize the climate crisis, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with the climate crisis. This is a case where 
average global temperatures is something we all will experience. And so the fact that uh, we're producing, pollu pro producing CO2 and China's producing CO2 and India's polluting CO2, we're all in this together. We're all going to be affected by that. Uh, and yet the impacts are going to be differential. Uh, Low-lying areas are going to get hit harder than non-low-lying areas by climate crisis. It'll be interesting to see what people in Duluth and Denver think of what's about to befall Florida, New York City, or Boston, uh, and what kind of collection, collective action will there, will there be in those cases. Um, there's been a lot of concern at the Harvard Center for the Environment about the geopolitics of this, which in part because Russia is a supporter of global warming. Uh, Russia sees nothing but benefit for the Russian country as the climate warms, uh, both because that will, I mean, it's a petro state uh, and it will improve agricultural productivity and a whole bunch of other issues. Uh, so what do you do on a, on a global basis where some countries want this to happen uh, and other countries in the South Pacific are gonna be wiped out if it happens? Uh, and so this question of David, you're saying that that Reagan's comment it's not about it's not uh, an epidemic of greed it's an epidemic of selfishness that may be the, well, the, the that's the, what you're the describing two hand, the, the two go hand in hand uh, it's a desire to profit or have comfortable lives uh, when the externalities are borne by someone else uh, when so the US could... doesn't oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I agree with uh, what you just said, Selman. The, what, what I meant by greed and arrogance was really what Reagan said. It's selfishness. And this is, in a, in a sense, the most fundamental principle of Western culture. It's the cogito ergo sum of Descartes. It's the foundational moment of Western culture. It's baked into the culture. The selfishness of individuals and selfishness of the Europeans. And okay, so that can be, to, so hold on just a second. That can be, how, so what do you do? And that generates harm. And, it, right. and one type of harm is epidemics and pandemics. The way to deal with that, uh, you know, it's hard to change the course of Western philosophy. That's a little difficult, is controls, governmental controls on that selfishness and the, the resultant greed and arrogance. It's about selfishness. It's about the emphasis on me as opposed to them. That's, that's what generates a lot of the suffering. Okay, so let me ask you guys, the three of you this before we open it up. Let's just say we are in all in agreement that it, it, it's linked to some sort of greed or selfishness. It's happening in these very complex social ways, right? Like it's not just a bunch of greedy people just sitting around saying, let's do X, Y, and Z. It's actually mediated through some very complex institutional frameworks, right? And, you know, as you're trying to figure out, like, you know, I, I just remember taking molecular mechanisms of microbial pathogenesis back in the early 90s. And we sat down and we mapped out what was happening inside cells when things happened, right? And I guess if I were to ask you, what's the map here? Because Eric, there's a convention that, that everyone has signed that the UN uh, upholds that, that says that, you know, that, that limits access to opiates and polices people. I mean, you should talk more about that in a second, but there's mechanisms, right? Reagan, you're dealing with a, you were dealing with an epidemic the WHO was directly involved, MSF was directly involved, the US government, the British government, like really big entities. And, you know, yet we couldn't get IV fluids into people until like a little, you know, small organization like PIH was like, yeah, we got to do it. And then some other people did it, you know, so, and, and, and David, you're dealing with, you, you know, you're mentioning all the countries and their contribution. Uh, and, you know, of course we, we keep hearing on the news, the Paris Accord and this Accord, and there's all these very large things. What is, what is perpetuating it? Is it, is it a, are these bureaucracies where nobody's responsible? Is it like what Hannah Arendt talks about? Is it like this, this kind of uh, uh, tyranny of nobody where these things are just moving down a certain path? Like what's, what's making this happen? Because the fact that you all know about it and we know about it and we're talking about it suggests that there is some element of common knowledge to this. So why is this happening? What, what's the social mechanism? The social pathogenesis. It, it, I, I suspect the answer will be different in different countries and relate to the political systems. So, you know, concretely, you know, why is Biden's climate initiative dead on arrival right now? You could say, well, it's because of Joe Manchin, 
Uh, and that, that's just part of it. The, the reason that Joe Manchin is the swing vote on this is because the people who support climate change only have half the Senate. And that, you know, there are 50 other senators who are also blocking the climate agenda. Uh, so, it, so while it's convenient to blame Joe Manchin, it's obviously a much broader part of that. And you could say, well, what's going on there? To what extent is it that these people are in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry? And Joe Manchin is the fossil fuel industry. I mean, he's a he's a coal person, so he's in his own pocket. I mean, that I don't think there's much doubt about that. Uh, but you know, like, what do you see on the news now? Like, it's a million stories a day about how gas prices are so high, uh, and all the discussion is we need to get gas prices lower. No one is, or you know, people say, you know, it took me two hundred dollars to fill up my gargantuan SUV. The reporters aren't saying, well, why don't you get a Nissan Leaf? They're saying, oh my gosh, that's awful. We have to get gas prices down. <laughs> and so just, you know, the, the, the politicians, the electorate, the way this is covered in the, in the media is just com completely hamstringing any kind of useful action in the US. Uh, and it's going to be different things in different countries. You know, it, when the UN had its first summit on the environment in 1972, only two heads of state showed up. It was in Stockholm, so the Swedish prime minister went, and then in, Indira Gandhi showed up. And she made her famous speech about how the developed world polluted for a century. Now it's our turn. We have to do this in order to catch up. You know, pollution is the uh, poverty is the biggest source of pollution. We need to raise our population out of poverty. And if that means India and China are going to spew out smoke for the next 50 years, that's our right because we have to do that to catch up. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain logic to that. Uh, it's short sighted, but you can you can see where that's coming from. And that thinking still remains prevalent in many of these developing countries. And you, so you've mentioned these threads of the power of, of industry, uh, you know, the needs of countries that, that differ. Um, Reagan, what, 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 do you, what do you take? What, what about the social mechanisms through which this is happening? Because it's easy to just say, okay, these guys are selfish. Let's say we're all selfish in a certain way. How is it actually mediated into the policies you saw on the ground? I'm thinking, I think it actually has to do with like sort of ease and complexity, right? Like addressing some of the, the social ideologies of, of disease, right? Whether it's related to climate change or um, real poverty of health systems in West Africa, in, in some ways is, is like deeply more complicated and tied into capitalism, right? Tied into selfishness and greed and all that. Whereas making something a very biomedical model of disease is, is actually feeds into capitalism, right? Because then you can design new drugs, right? You can create treatments, uh, make vaccines. And that is, um, in some ways, I think, cognitively easier for all of us, right? Both as individuals, but also as governments. Um, to your, your comment about COVID investment, there was a study in West Africa done by, I think it was Save the Children, that, that said that four point, I think, $3 billion was spent on the COVID response, but that a, a study beforehand had said basically a billion dollars would have put universal primary care in all three countries that were affected. Um, and time and time again, to the COVID point, like we as a globe or we as countries don't make those investments in like the health systems right and instead focus on individual responsibility on individual treatments on biomedical model um, thank you that's a really good point eric your thoughts yeah well you know i think you raised a good point by uh, uh Salman, when you said um that the long-term gain would be uh, would be enormous. So if if selfishness is the driver, why don't we see that um, by investment now in you know preventing climate change uh, will will end up benefiting us? And it's because the selfishness is also a short-term selfishness, and that's partly uh, for political reasons. I want to profit now. Um, I need to, uh, to, to, to show what I'm doing now um, and uh, future generations will take care of themselves. You mentioned Hannah Arendt and uh, tyranny of no one. And I think it's a really important point, Salman. Hannah Arendt was actually a student of Heidegger's. And Heidegger thought a lot about uh, uh, technology, Martin Heidegger, the, the philosopher, um, of how Western culture has uh, this self-evolving uh, process, more and more technology, more and more power over nature. And it's not something that we can control. 
it's a way of thinking that's going to take its course. Um, how to interrupt that? How to uh, uh, intercede there? Um, you know, th that's the question that Heidegger asked. I guess I would, uh, one very perhaps uh, um, simple-minded uh, answer, but I think it's an important one, is that the very cultures that the Europeans thought that they had to uh, either eradicate or impose their own culture upon because these were primitive cultures and they were unenlightened and they weren't Christian or Jewish. And so Europe, Europe had to, had to, you know, uh, uh, had to uh, enlighten the rest of the world and dispel these, uh, these silly ideas. Um, those very cultures can provide other ways of thinking about each other, about the environment, about how to interact with each other, about who we are. Uh, maybe not just as individuals, but as members of families and communities and, uh, uh, and, and global. And one, again, very simple-minded example that just struck me and it, it, it's constantly revolving in my head. When I visited uh, the Lakota reservations in, um, in South Dakota, in Pine Ridge and Rosebud, and I was speaking to a tribal elder and uh, she, she just said something uh, about um, how in traditional Lakota culture, everything with legs, wings, and roots is my relative. And we, we must respect our relatives and take care of them. Now, wouldn't that idea make an enormous difference uh, if that were so? If if that were the background of, of of a culture, rather than I think, therefore I am, and the world is there for me, and it's a bunch of objects that are there for me to master, measure, um, uh, use, exploit, and dispose of. Yeah. That would be a different. Let's open it up. We've this has been a, a good good start. We've got about twenty minutes left. Can we, you know, if there's anyone in the in the audience that has any thoughts, uh, I see a lot of people that have been working for a number of years uh, in different communities in the U.S. and elsewhere. I would love your thoughts about what you're thinking about epidemics. Don't rush all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Anderson, please. You're on mute. I think you're you're on mute. We can't hear you. I yeah. think by now I would have learned how to do this, wouldn't you? But uh, uh, I probably shouldn't say anything because I arrived late and I missed most all of David's presentation, actually. And um, I also, it turns out, have COVID, so I may oh. not be making much sense. So, uh, uh, but um, as the discussion uh, developed, especially the question, Salman, that you asked at the end and Regan's uh, response, actually, it reminded me of um, discussions with Paul that I started, but of course, we never really got very far, unfortunately. And that was about the 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 limitations of a uh, uh, oh, in a sense of social medicine of um, uh, notions of structural violence these days um, uh, and whether that would be that's sufficient to uh, uh, get the sort of analytic traction we need to deal with uh, epidemics and pandemics disease outbreaks uh, chronic disease and so on and um, and uh, I was thinking of that maybe we should start to be think about more about eco ecosystemic violence, ecosystemic violence, which would in a sense encompass I think all sorts of structural violence, and so that's what I was uh, uh, hoping when there's a sort of I think the title said bio social and quite often the bio gets missed and maybe it should have been a geo-social analysis. Um, and uh, of course, I've been reflecting too on the development of social medicine 
because, uh, well, David will be at a conference that uh, Anna Kvine Lee and Jeremy Green, and to, to a lesser extent, I have been organizing in Bergen on the history of social, global social medicine, that is. Um, and of course, in the 19th century, uh, social medicine encompassed geographical pathologies, environmental pathologies. Um, and, um, the, the, uh, uh, and we seem to have lost that to a large extent. I think we need to think um, beyond the proximate, as Tony McMichael uh, put it, the epidemiologist who was really the founder of planetary health. We need to think beyond the proximate, beyond contaminationist models, think about configuration, but in particular, think about systems, uh, ecosystems, which include, of course, the social, the human and everything like that. So I'm just wondering whether that uh, is uh, something that uh, people at Harvard are interested in. Any, any thoughts? And the, 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 yeah, the short answer is yes. You know, the School of Public Health is the official host of the Planetary Health Alliance, uh, you know, which is one of the institutional incarnations of this move towards planetary health. And I, Warwick knows this history better than I do. So he's been writing a, a book on this. But there's been a, a series of moves from international health to global health to one health and now planetary health. Uh, and the hope always is that these will get tractions to do the kind of work that Warwick is saying to, to expand our notions of the bio, to include not just the species centrism, we need to make the world a profitable place for humans, uh, and secondarily a healthy place for humans. Uh, but how do we, how are we concerned about all these other creatures? And I, I was struck by that quote uh, from the Lakota elder uh, that Eric had mentioned. Uh, you know, the question is how to do that. Uh, and you know the, the species centrism is is a you know a profound factor, and every time, uh, at least in the U.S., every time there seems to be movement in a, in a hopeful direction about the climate crisis, you know something will happen. Gas prices increase, uh, and all of a sudden, self interest sharpens everyone's uh, attention very much on the here and now. Uh, Australia, you know, has has its own complicated role in this. Uh, as a major exporter of coal still to India. Uh, and the, even as you know, the, the, Indi the Australian press, just like the US press, you know, natural disasters are often you know, the, one of the, the key players, whether it's floods or fires or what have you. Uh, and so trying to figure out what would it actually mean to get the attention of political leaders and the publics more broadly to really focus on that Lakota vision of needing to care for all living creatures. Uh, people have been, have been trying. Uh, I just don't think any of these advocates uh, for planetary health or others have yet figured out the arguments that are going to gain traction. Uh, it could be if we do a better job as scholars with something like a, a geosocial analysis. I love the sound of that. Also think about like, what brainstorm of the work about what that might actually look like or mean. Uh, uh, but we, we, need to, we need to do something along those lines. So I just I want to pull, pull, pull Alan into this because Warwick, I think you've raised a really good point. And you know, there's this there is a linkage between medical science and cultural values. I think in your fantastic work on the Philippines, you you know you kind of link the Pasteurian uh, revolution uh, to just thinking about this these ideas of contagion and that kind of you know changing. Uh, the way that you know Filipinos were, were viewed, and I thought you brilliantly laid it out. And you know, I'm sure your thinking has moved on since then. But it it, it just it's, it's a really clear idea. And I wonder, you know, as you're looking at, you know, this couple of centuries of extraction and social values around how, that it's okay to extract from X or it's okay to do whatever. Because you know, whether you're looking after the earth or you're looking after a poor person in India, or you're looking after a native Indian, the whole, you know, in, in the United States, the, the whole, the, the idea of from who and from what can you extract, who can you own, who can you not, and then the care you give them, like, what are the cultural values that are playing part in this? And well, Alan, you wrote actually, about that too. Selman, could I, could I just say that I don't yeah. think my thinking has moved on. I hope it hasn't in a way, uh, because another part of that book is how climate gets displaced as yes. uh, pathogenic by a concern with the social transmission of microbes, which is 
heavily racialized in the Philippines. Right. And That's so right. then right. this racialized form of social medicine, which in a sense um, actually eliminate tries to eliminate the uh, uh, or climate anyhow. The more uh, the the it doesn't of course eliminate environments, but it in, it it, try, it tries to um, substitute a sort of social pathology. And and I think what's happening now is in a sense we're returning to that 19th century vision, but less as a Hippocratic vision and more as a an ecosystem. Uh, uh, vision, if you like. And so I, I'm, I, I mean, I, I started to talk about this with Paul, and he was, I think, very sympathetic. But I just wonder now um, that we've lost Paul, where the, the department and the program more generally uh, will go, whether, because uh, I, I, I got the impression that Paul thought that was the way that uh, it should move in a sense it's moving moving back to the 19th century almost uh, the 19th century version of social well, medicine but, but scaled up to the planetary of course and, and well you know, you're raising a good point Marty and I were teaching a course with Jason Silverstein who's also on here uh, you know on, on neoliberalism and the interesting thing is one of the questions we asked is what's neo about neoliberalism and the more we, you know, the, the way we set up the course, we started with the East India Company. We, you know, we we went down the whole thing, and we realized there's not that much that's neo. There are certain methods and things that are neo, but the idea of extraction and what you can take and how you you construct the other and the culture around it are very similar. And so, you know, as I'm thinking of that ecosystem that you're talking about, I'm thinking about well, the the difference between the simple British East India Company, and let's say, I don't know, you know, th to throw it out there, the World Trade Organization and the way we organize trade and extraction. They're, they're, obviously, one is a very is a more complex bureaucracy than the than the first, but they they both are are, are have a way of superseding people's rights and, and superseding countries and sovereignty and what have you, right? And so you you know you start to realize that there are these social patterns that emerge and these. And they're almost cultural patterns because people think, oh, the UN is great. Oh, the WTO, what a great idea. Everyone can come together. Oh, you know, so, and, and you, you, you see these things emerging and, and they of course uphold certain ideas as you're, you're saying. And so I, I wonder, you know, uh, you know Alan, you, you've of course been looking at this for, for many years. You know, when you look at it, what is, the, what is the culture around this? Because this can only happen if everyone thinks it's okay, right? Well, you know, I think it can happen even if, even if people don't think it's okay, it's, it's happening. And I, I find myself, I think, as so many of us do right now, thinking like, you know, um, Paul would have offered a comment, you know, at this juncture in this session. And, you know, what would he say about this? And I think there, I think that he was always uncomfortable saying that the problem is greed and arrogance. And, I, I certainly understand that, but I never heard Paul say something like that, I think. No. And my notion of how Paul thought about it was, as so many people are saying now, he was a great humanitarian. He went to treat the poorest of the poor. He wanted them to, to have the absolute best care that anyone could provide. And he resisted the nihilistic um, arguments constantly that we can't do anything about that. And quite frankly, a lot of great people could have left it at that. But I think what Paul really did is he then started to track back. And it was, if we can't, or if people are making these arguments, what are the obstacles? Is, are there rational aspects of it? Or is it part of an ideological system of structural violence that builds these obstacles? So when I read fevers, feuds, and diamonds, you know, you start tracking back a little bit. You get the general context. What was it like in West Africa during the pandemic? You have to see that. You have to feel that. You have to understand the cultural politics of that. But then you track back more deeply. And I think it's one of the reasons why Paul got so deeply interested in history because to really understand the full set of causal links to what's happening in the individual patient suffering pain or the patient whose body is reflecting, taking in pollutants um, or you know, all the things we study, 
you can see what the end result is, but then you have to track back as far and aggressively and as sophisticatedly as you can. And I think that's generally what we came to understand as biosocial. Um, I think in some ways it, it takes in geosystems, it takes in the environment. One of the things we know about Paul in these last years was how deeply he understood the environmental threat or the planetary ecosystem threat to producing the, the, the violence and suffering that we see on the ground. And I think when we look back at COVID um, and we really start to track back, people will say, well, where did it come from? How did we fight it? We've done a terrible job around the world. Our systems don't work in the relationship of um, global forces and pathogens and the way they spread. Um, you know, it will create, you know, it's, it's making those connections again and again and again. And I think Paul wanted to resist the idea of like, well, it was greedy people, although he certainly knew about greed, or it was individuals who should be responsible for their health. That's the other side of that argument. And it was much more systematic about trying to understand these structures that do it. And the last piece of this is, you know, we can reflect on causality, but Paul understood it would take incredibly aggressive advocacy and activism. And, and the source of that activism, what were the people who were really suffering? and the people who didn't have access to what any of us would expect in a tolerable human world, they would have access to opioids when they're in pain, surgery when they have a broken leg, cancer treatment um, if they had leukemia. And so I keep thinking that, you know, sometimes I hear the talks and I think, I want to rail against the machine, you know, rage against the machine. I want to destroy, you know, aggressive corporate capitalism. But I think it's in the observation of the connections and the activism that can be infused that, you know, Paul would have said, this is what we have to do. And it's very different than, you know, those of us who have worked at more theoretical levels and not communicated across the, those threads. So I don't know if that's right, but yeah. sort of the perception I have is that. You know, Alan uh, and all, I, I just, you know, I'm, I, as you know, Paul was very, there, there, there was this ongoing debate over many years about, you know, the structural violence, social structure versus individual agency and where it, plays in this and obviously you know as you see these kind of social forces take over reagan said something really you said a number of important things but one thing that that really I, i've been wanting to come back to reagan is you pointed out that that capitalism creates a situation and then creates the solution right that that you can use to fix it and in a way it becomes like a force of production and so you know alan when you start to look at these total totalizing systems I just wonder where the points of resistance are, because if you know if you if you uh, make people work shift work, and you say, oh my God, people get tired when they work shift work. Oh, let's create pro vigil, a drug that will keep people up, right, so that they can do better shift work. You know, and so you you create the solution to a problem that is a problem that's created because of the system that we have. And I yeah. just wonder, you know, and of course you can't say, well, is the scientist that created provisional to blame or, you know, in those ways, it's very sy systemic. But in the case of like, say, not giving IV fluids, it's systemic in the sense that people think that people in poor countries should be contained and not get, get IV fluids. But somebody's actually making that decision. Paul showed me an email from somebody that is literally at the top of, the, it's at the apex of the system that yes. says this won't work. And so... When in fact it's like water into somebody's vessels, of course it'll work. And so I'm just wondering, like, what what is that? That's where's that in structure and agency? I, I think it's such a great question because one of the problems I think for the social sciences is by eliminating agency, we make ourselves cynical, and that was totally unacceptable to Paul. So how do you find those points of resistance? And I think Paul found them quite frankly 
through clearly identifiable narratives of immorality and moral outrage. So when people tie Paul's moral vision to the work on the ground, to the understanding at a systemic level what's going on, it was identifying something that was palpably outrageous and intolerable. And then people go back and start to look for potentials for change. Well, we can get ARTs to Africa. We can treat um, multi-drug resistant TB. We can hydrate patients in West Africa during the Ebola pandemic. And so it was, you know, I don't think that all of this has been fully articulated. And I think we're going to be examining this for a long time. But, you know, my historical work would be totally in isolation from this, if not for trying to make these linkages that Paul, I think, was so instructive about. Alan, you, you, you've put this uh, so eloquently, so I'm going to let you have the last word. Let me, let me thank uh, Eric uh, and David and Reagan and, and, and Warwick for coming for a, a wonderful cameo <laughs> appearance and Alan for your comments and for everyone for joining us today. This is such a rich topic. Hopefully this will not be our last discussion. Uh, Warwick has put some really great, uh, great comments there. So, uh, uh, you know, about the uh, articulation between political economy of health and ecosystem peril. I think we need to pick that up more, but I think we leave today's discussion with just, you know, realizing the, the social biological complexity that is required when we're thinking about epidemics. So hopefully many more conversations. Thank you everyone. And we hope to see you at our next session. Take care. Bye-bye. Reagan, thank you. I see you're at work. Thank you for, for no problem. <laughs> yeah. I'm going into a shift later, so I just, you know, okay. keep it simple. <laughs> really appreciate it as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take Thanks care, everyone. Well. Bye bye. Bye bye.